bringing national topics that matter to Oklahoma. With Congressman Tom Cole. This is Cole on Congress. Thank you today for joining me for another episode of Cole on Congress. Today, it's a special honor to introduce a national hero, Oklahoma's very own Lieutenant General Thomas Stafford. As many of you know, if you've uh, watched, visited uh, air, his Air and Space uh, Museum in Weatherford, General Stafford is a former Air Force officer, test pilot, and notable NASA astronaut. His decades of service to the United States, particularly during the space rate, has truly made significant and lasting impact uh, that will be felt nationwide for many, many generations to come. General Stafford, I got to tell you, thank you for being here. It's a great thrill to have you. We've been friends for a long time, and uh, I've admired you uh, both from afar and now had the opportunity to do a little bit closer. So it's just a great pleasure to have you here. Well, Congressman Cole, it's good to be here with you and say we have known each other for a long time. And I've seen what you've done for Oklahoma, so it's really great to be here. Well, it's it's it, it, uh, it's pretty insignificant compared to what you've done, not just for Oklahoma, but for <laughs> our entire country, and, and frankly for humanity in terms of what you've accomplished in space. But a pretty uh, pretty remarkable life, uh, you know, and uh, career pattern for a, a kid born uh, in Weatherford, Oklahoma. So. Uh, Tell me, how in the world did you make the decision to get involved and how Oklahoma maybe shaped you a little bit uh, as you were making critical decisions as a young man? Well, I, when I grew up in Weatherford, it was a small town. Maybe 3,000 people at the most is the end of the Dust Bowl. And <clears throat> people will ask me, do you always want to be a pilot and astronaut? Well, the word astronaut <laughs> when I was growing up. But uh, the first transcontinental air route, New York to Los Angeles, followed old Route 66 from Chicago down. Right. And 66 was a main street of Weatherford. And so three or four times a day, I'd see what I would think this giant silver aircraft fly over. I'd look up, and I said, I want to do that. I want to be a pilot. So I, I knew from the time I was probably five years old, six years old, I wanted to be a pilot. And I followed that all the way through. and. From the Naval, I was fortunate and got an appointment to the Naval Academy, and I also did have a a, a slot for a, a Air Force ROT, pardon me, NROTC at Oklahoma University. But I'm glad I went to the Naval Academy. <laughs> I, o, o, OU's a great school. Well, hey, uh, we're just we're just happy you made the decision you did. And after you got in uh, to the service, obviously you had a very distinguished career as a, a traditional career as, a, as an officer in the Air Force, but along the way you had to make a, another decision uh, to decide to apply for NASA, which was highly competitive, become an astronaut. Tell me the background that led you to that, uh, that That's choice. Right. Well, you know, you look, you talk about the military career there, Congressman. Uh, it goes back to Oklahoma. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I got my mother to reluctantly sign a waiver, and, and I joined the Oklahoma National Guard. So my first uh, uh, really active duty for that summer duty was, was three weeks at Fort Sill. <laughs> and then just before my 18th birthday, it's the 17th. No, after, after being at Fort Sill, no wonder you opted for the Navy. <laughs> yeah. I still remember the dust blowing. I was out there and the 105 <laughs> houses were firing. And I worked up to Corporal there in the Oklahoma National Guard, sir. And, uh, and then I went to the Naval Academy and and that we had some aviation indoctrination, and that just made me more motivated than ever. But the Korean War was going on, and um, you know I was gung ho, and all the air, the Navy had was just a straight wing Panther, and the Air Force had the first swept wing airplane, the F eighty six. Yes, sir. And you can see one of those out at the museum at Weatherford. We used to fly, and uh, and they were shooting down wings. And you know, I was a cold warrior then. I wanted to go to Korea, shoot down MiGs, and kill commies. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, why I went to Naval Academy. You know, the, uh, well, the I, I, well, again, you had a, a very traditional path, and uh, were you know very accomplished. I know you were stationed in a number of places and uh, in interceptor squadrons, mm -hmm. and moved up to from pilot to flight leader. But again, at some point, you made a, a big decision. I mean, you spent 
a lot of you, you made a decision to make a career move to to move toward the space program at right, a time well, where that would have been a, a you know a, a high risk call in some ways I would think. Well, <clears throat> it was a series of evolutions, Tom. I wanted to uh, always wanted to fly higher and faster, <laughs> and uh, so of course test pilots do that. So I applied. It was very competitive and was selected in test pilot school and worked hard and stood number one out there and then stayed on as both a test pilot and an instructor at the test pilot school. And then uh, <clears throat> the astronaut program had just uh, started after I was a student, when I was still a student. So I was not eligible for the first group of astronauts, Mercury, like mm -hmm. Gordon Cooper was. So, uh, but uh, then when, <clears throat> during the time <clears throat> that I was there at Edwards, President Kennedy made the commitment that we will go to the moon and return in this decade. So I said, that's for me. And so I applied for the second group. It was very competitive. I think over 2,000 people. Some of them certainly weren't, didn't have all the qualifications. And they selected nine. Wow. And out of our group of nine, uh, we did most of the uh, Gemini and the Apollo missions. Well, you, you were with a pretty extraordinary group of Oklahomans in those days. And, mm -hmm. and we were chatting on the way over here. And I, I remember at least at one point, Oklahoma had more astronauts than any other uh, state. And uh, so tell us a little bit about the, the record that Oklahoma notched in, the, in space flight with the kind of distinguished uh, people like you that have uh, made that decision to go into that area. Well, it was a NASA historian that put together some data, which uh, I guess I, I was so busy doing things I didn't realize. but. Uh, now you look at the first programs, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, and Apollo Soyuz. Before we started flying the shuttle, uh, Oklahoma astronauts had more time in space than astronauts from any other state, and yet we only had about one and a half percent of the population. Wow. Pretty remarkable. Were any of those, uh, those uh, colleagues of yours particularly stand out in your mind? Well, I knew uh, Gordon Cooper so very well, and he was my backup commander for Apollo 10 when I went to the moon. And uh, Gordon was a great friend. And then, of course, I know Owen Garriott. He worked for me when I headed the astronaut group. Well, tell me a little bit about uh, that Apollo 10 flight, because I remember watching it on uh, television. I mean, you guys were broadcasting, and uh, it got closer to the lunar surface, and we're literally mapping out the way for... Uh, uh, for uh, your your colleagues uh, to come after you, uh, right. you know, Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, those guys. So uh, tell us a little bit about that. that was that was an incredible mission. Right. Well, we uh, the way we started in Apollo after the tragic fire we had, and also some of the systems failures they had had in the, in Mercury, and some of the systems problems we had in Gemini. We didn't know. We didn't say one crew's going to land on the moon. Said we'll have about four or five commanders in their crews will cycle through every third one. So I was the backup commander for the first Apollo flight. Wally Sherrall was the first uh, commander. I went together, Wally and I had done the first rendezvous in space ever to prove the theory was right. Because there was a lot of pressure on that one, sir. Because we had finally decided the way to go to the moon is do a rendezvous around the moon, except nobody had ever done a rendezvous. <laughs> and we proved that one out. And. Uh, and so I, from three, I'd rotate to 10, and then Neil Armstrong and his crew backed up eight, and Ed rotate to 11, and Pete Conrad backed up nine, and his crew, they'd go to 12. So we'd start down that. And uh, the lunar module program was a real tough design to get the lunar module that light. And so they finally had a, a program called the Super Weight Improvement Program. And they gave Grumman $10,000 a pound, which is a lot of money back in 66, 67, to carve every bit of metal they could out of that spacecraft. And I happened to have the last, I had a heavy spacecraft. I, unfortunately, sir, I was too heavy to land. <laughs> uh, or Cernan and I would have been the first two to walk on the moon. But uh, what we did, we separated from the command module with John Young, and then I went down with Cernan, co-pilot. We radar map, we photo map, visually picked out the uh, say a landing ellipse, the potential for the next flight, and uh, which would be a lightweight lunar module, the way the sequence broke for Neil. So. And we did, we did that. We did three passes like that. And then uh, 
went back. I did the first rendezvous around the moon and stayed there for two, another day and a half, picked out four of the six sites and came back. And on that way home, just before we hit the atmosphere, we set the all-time world speed record. Well, and what was that? 24,791 miles an hour. And that still stands? Yes, sir. Wow. So that's about seven miles a second. So you could go from <laughs> Weatherford to Oklahoma City in a little less than 10 seconds. <laughs> Oklahoma <laughs> Highway Patrol would never touch it. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, you know, uh, in that period of time, actually the first opportunity, I don't know if you'll even remember this, I had to meet you, you'd become such a national figure and, and a hero and obviously so highly regarded in our home state. Uh, that I know a number of people tried to talk you into running for the United States Senate. And uh, you looked at that a little bit, and, uh, you know, I think you'd have been a great senator. I, well, uh, on the other hand, you did so many extraordinary things after that. Uh, what what made you make the decision to, to stay in the career lane you were in? Because there's no question you would have been extremely successful if you had entered the political arena. Well, that's, I like people. I like to explain things, but... I guess the one thing I didn't, that made me uncomfortable was going out trying to raise money. <laughs> I have to raise money, and I just didn't feel comfortable. That and I, in my mind, I still like technical management things, and that, that's more my fort, forte. But uh, it, it was a real interesting thing. I just uh, talked about a few things, and I had a, a lot of people. Henry Bellman and even Dewey Bartley one time asked me to uh, take a look at it, but. Uh, I turned it down. Well, yeah, and you know what? After you did, that's actually when uh, Governor Bartlett, who'd lost in 1970, yeah. then made the decision. But I agree. I think he would have deferred had you made the decision to run. I, there yeah. was there was a lot of excitement. Uh, I remember meeting you actually with my mom and dad. My dad was career Air Force, and yeah. you came to the little Chamber of Commerce building in Moore, Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, and there were a group of Republican activists that were all excited to meet you and uh, all hopeful that you'd make that decision as you were kind of doing a little listening to us, I guess. I was around the state. listening. Yeah, no, it was mostly us urging you, not you asking us. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, uh, but you did make that decision and you went on, uh, you know, I've done so many things, but particularly after that, the, uh, the Soyuz, uh, Apollo, or Apollo Soyuz project was an extraordinary moment in, uh, uh, you, you mentioned earlier you were a coal warrior and what mm -hmm. you wanted to do in the 50s. And here you find yourself in the 1970s really as uh, a leader in one of the efforts uh, to bring the old Soviet Union, the United States, together in a cooperative enterprise mm -hmm. in space. It's really historic, uh, uh, diplomatic, as well as, uh, as obviously technical achievement. So tell us a little bit about how that happened and what were your initial thoughts when you were uh, recruited, I, I'm sure, I assume, to to uh, to you know under to lead this really extraordinary mission. Well, I had to perform more rendezvous than anybody in space, the world had then, and I was head of the astronaut group, and so it was decided. Uh, you know, I started talking. It was just kind of a natural evolution where the head of NASA in about 19. 69, 70, talked to the head of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Look, we've been in the moon, and, and they were working their first little rudimentary space station. Why don't we get together and perhaps do something cooperative? And then, they, in fact, I went over on one trip before it was announced and just to look at the feasibility. This was the height of the Cold War. Each country had four to 6,000 strategic nuclear weapons named at each other, plus thousands of tactical nukes, armed many tanks, artillery pieces, APCs. So uh, there I, I found that uh, they were, well, it was nothing political, just professional, just like we were working. That was very interesting to me. And so then when I was selected, and then uh, that's, I, a couple of times I had to draw a line in the sand, sir. Uh, you know, the Soviets were really obsessed with secrecy. They said uh, after, after it was signed by President Nixon and, uh, uh, President Kosygin was Secretary Brezhnev looking on there in March of 1972 in Moscow in his big summit meeting. That we'd have this joint Apollo Soyuz in uh, July 75. That um, that was all right. That was both countries were committed to it. But then the, the Soviets said we'll announce our crew six months before. And then when they called me in, Chris Kraft said he wanted me to head the mission. I said, fine, but I said, Chris, 
we can't do this just six months before. I need at least two years. So I get to know the systems that I use. They know our systems. I can speak the, the Russian language. What happens to all the emergency procedures if we have some decreased cabin pressure or smoke or fire or out of control? It's going to be a, a bear getting all the flight controllers working together. So uh, they backed me completely. So here in February of 73, I drew a line. We announced our crew. It would be Stafford, Brand, and Slayton. And so we're here. Where are you? And so that put the pressure on the Soviets. So at the Paris Air Show in, this, in uh, June of 19. 73, they announced it would be Leonov and Kubasov as well, my counterparts. So, uh, so in fact, three times I refused to, uh, semi kind of refused to fly the mission unless the Soviets came through. That was the first one. What were the other two? Well, the other one was that the, I had to have a representative, a fellow astronaut, in their mission control center, you know, in case to coordinate things, in case things go wrong. You can't ever tell. We always have problems. Oh, no, no, this is a big secret. I says, well, then I'm not going to fly. NASA would always back me up. The last one is that they'd have it live on television because all ours are live and mm -hmm. they never showed it live. And they, they finally acquiesced on that. In fact, so much so that the American ambassador was down there to see the launch. That's the first time that the uh, Russian people, the Soviet people, kind of mix them together, uh, saw a live launch. And then they didn't do it for a few years after now. It's, commonplace. Well, you know, you must have made, uh, and I know you did, an incredible range of uh, connections and relationships with Russians, and you still maintain, uh, you know, contact today with uh, their space program. Yes, uh, sir. Tell me uh, if you're measuring where they're at, where we're at, what's the level of cooperation mm -hmm. now compared to what it was uh, in the Apollo-Soyuz era? Well, in the Apollo-Soyuz, the uh, it was it was strictly professional, Congressman, and we and we worked together. They were professional test pilots and cosmonauts and the engineers and and so. But we had, we were breaking new ground. We'd never worked together before, so we had to work out what would be the management group, the mission operations group, the environmental control group, the mechanical interface group, the electrical group, and all this. In fact, that's what set the basis the le later led to the shuttle mirror and now the International Space Station. So uh, it, was, it was interesting. So for six periods of time, I lived in the Soviet Union, and uh, for about a month to six weeks of time, the cosmonauts would be down at Houston, and they were at our homes a lot, and we were at their homes. So we really got to know each other and said, gee, these are great people. In fact, they're, they're more like Midwesterners and <laughs> a lot of Europeans I knew. And I said, you know, sometime uh, that uh, I think that we'll, we'll be close kind of allies and, and, and work together. So it, it, was, it was a real unique experience. Where going to the moon was unique in itself, but living in the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War, everywhere I went, I was welcomed. Well, that's, uh, that is something indeed in that era. And it, it put together, and it kind of, that was the end of the space race we had with the Soviet Union. When I shook hands with Leonov. Yeah, very famous, uh, very famous handshake in space. One thing I didn't know later on is, said I mean, when we started to work again, I I would recommend we did, but you know things geopolitically didn't work out too well for, for about 15 or 20 years, and we started flying again with shuttle Mir, and so they asked me to head an oversight committee, you know, for safety operational readiness because of my experience with them, and I still do this today, but I was going back and forth to. Uh, so Russia so much and all that and you know I had two daughters who were school teachers and I always wanted a son so with my second wife I said we need to adopt a, a boy and we're talking she says no you need two boys and she was right I said they'll be Russian because of the laws and all this and I said, the Russians are hardy people they're smart people they're used to hardship and all that so I didn't know that when I flew Apollo Soyuz that Twenty some years later, I'd adopt two Russian orphan boys. <laughs> That's an unbelievable story. Well, looking at the programs today, I mean, you know, if you're my age, you remember, of course, the competitive nature of our programs. You remember this moment of cooperation. 
and then we did drift apart again in the 1980s, and uh, we're now cooperating against some degree. Actually, in some ways, I'm a little uncomfortable with. We're hitching rides on on Russian rockets. So yeah, tell us, uh, you know, where you think they are and where we are. And of course, there are now other people, when the Europeans are in space, the Chinese have a major effort underway. So if you're looking uh, as, as a professional at uh, the state of, if you will, the global space program that we're still very much part of, how do you assess where we are in space uh, as a country, but frankly also as humanity? What, what are the things that we're doing well? What are the things that maybe we ought to uh, rethink and, uh, uh, and uh, be more involved in? Well, we had a, I thought a very good program, the Constellation program, that was put together bipartisan after the tragic Columbia accident mm -hmm. and said separate the crew from the payload <laughs> and uh, this was well thought out, studied, and supported. And then when the present administration came in, they said, no, it was started under previous administration. And you can't go changing programs like this every administration. You know, like you start building a ship, it takes six or eight years, you can't say. New administration comes in, I don't want to build that ship, we'll build some. <laughs> These things take years, and when they, we should have started right away and having, uh, after the shuttle, when the shuttle quit, we should have had within a year, several, within two or three years, an American rocket and spacecraft ready to go. And we <coughs> had it outlined, but uh, this uh, administration, for, in my viewpoint, unfortunately canceled it. And so now <coughs> we're riding on Russian rockets. And, uh, and but uh, I, th I think each country, their capable, should have their own Capability, and so I think we're 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 behind as far as boost capability because of some political decisions made here. Well, it's, it's interesting too to see the the Chinese with a very aggressive program of their own. I've all, often speculated uh, uh, if the next person on the moon is Chinese, I think the American public will will be pretty upset about what's happened. Why are are we not? Uh, uh, you know, involved in doing that. I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are uh, on that. Well, I, I certainly agree with you, sir. And, you know, the last American that walked on the moon, Gene Cernan, was in December 1940, 19, uh, um, was it 72. 72, 72, December 72. Wow, that's and a so, long time. A long time. <clears throat> and there's a lot of reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, those studies that uh, President uh, Bush Sr. asked me to do, how to go back to the moon on the Mars, and it outlined there's a reason to go to the moon and there's a reason to go to Mars. What, what are those? Because I think people still struggle with, uh, you know, if, if we know we're involved, we know the advantages of, of near space exploration and uh, what's that shielded in terms of science. We know the value of satellites and everything from yeah. weather prediction to communication yeah. to obviously national security. Yeah. These are extraordinarily uh, useful uh, area for us to be involved in. But what would be the case for resuming manned flight to the moon and thinking beyond that to Mars? Well, the, the manned flights to the moon, one thing, there's a lot of science that can be done there. And, uh, and this is all outlined in that book, that, a study that I chaired for 11 months, and then the vice president and I had a joint press conference in the White House and outlined all the reasons. It's called America, <coughs> pardon me, America at the Threshold, and then the reasons to go to Mars, which is the planet most like the Earth. At one time, it had tremendous amounts of water, and what happened to it? And so we could see the evolution of the Earth in the same way that we don't completely understand today. Still, there may be some data there, and so, <clears throat> but the, the one thing I like to explain to people is every dollar spent in space is spent here on the Earth, and people pay taxes and services and goods and all that. It's not just taken and thrown away out in space. Well, and look at the commercial spinoffs out of the space program. I mean, oh, it's been pretty terrific. dramatic in terms of uh, how it's improved the quality of life and, uh, frankly, been an enormous boost to our own economy. Well, the, uh, I remember the Wharton School of Business did a study after Apollo, and they, their study showed that 
It returned to the American public, I think seven to one for every dollar spent on the space program, returned seven to one. But it revolutionized computing power. You see, it revolutionized a lot of biomedicine. And so we're still living off some of that technology level that Apollo pushed us up to. And so it'll, it'll push us to another level, sir. Well, uh, about all the extraordinary things you've done and achievements and, and programs you've been part of, uh, if you had to pick one or two, what are the ones that were the most personally satisfying, but also, in your view, the most historically significant things that really have made an impact on, uh, on our time and our place? Well, there's, well, <coughs> the space, you know, doing the, for proving out that first rendezvous in space, you'll never forget your first flight, but uh, the, the one to, then uh, with Gene Sir in that second flight, Gemini 9, three different types of rendezvous, including the standard one we'd do on the moon. He was the first one to walk in space around the world. I had a heck of a time getting him back in. <laughs> he fogged over, couldn't see. Wow. It. That was a tough situation. Wow. But from there, we learned about training underwater. And so that was, you know, was, you learn as you go, but there were some tough times. And then going to the moon is so unique. There's only 24 of us that ever did that. Uh, that, that was a unique one. You look back at the earth, it's about the size of an orange, and by then it was just half an orange. So it was hard to believe it. At that time, there's four and a half billion people, now there's six. And you say, why couldn't people live together in peace and get along? <laughs> why do we have all those problems? <clears throat> then I splashed down the Pacific Ocean back here. We still had the problems. And then the Apollo Soyuz bringing people together. And I'm, I'm very glad now that all these 16, 15, 16 countries are working together and all that in space is working good. Sometimes on the ground they have some problems. <laughs> but then the other part was could, was not <clears throat> being able to talk about. Uh, I've always liked to change technology. I was the one that started stealth. And the, the, and what I started, I had no statement either requirements. Uh, I started, the one, I was in charge of testing it after it showed up when I was commanding general of the flight test and the first experimental stealth out of Area 51. Yeah. And then from there, as soon as I became deputy chief of staff, I started the, the F-117A, the Nighthawk, the first stealth attack plane. And then one afternoon in a hotel room in Chicago, I wrote the specs on a piece of hotel stationery and started the B-2 stealth bomber and then the stealth cruise missile. So I'm, I'm very proud of that, sir, but I couldn't talk about it for years. <laughs> Well, we're, we're very proud of you. We've just got a, a few seconds left, and uh, boy, I could do a lot more than 30 minutes with you, General. I, uh, one of my aides, uh, as we were coming down here, mentioned that you'd led, she thought, thought four lifetimes at least packed into one. So just thank you for the extraordinary achievements uh, for our country and frankly for all humanity and what you've done. And, uh, and your continued activity and focus and interest on these things to these days. It's just an invaluable contribution. So uh, I just uh, uh, wish you many more years in, in this kind of activity. It's just it's extraordinary. Amazing. Great privilege for me to get to have you on the show. Well, Congressman, it's a real privilege to be with you here. And I say I'm very honored to be from Oklahoma. And I still uh, consider myself an Okie. We keep a home there in Oak City. We don't visit that much. But <laughs> the um, get back there and also to go to what my hometown of Weatherford and see the museum and it's good, so it's okay. great to be seeing you. Well, been great to have you here. Yes, so sir. thanks for being on the show. Thank you, sir. Yeah.